Welcome. I'm so glad you're here and welcome to our virtual audience. You are joining in Startup Advisor Lunch and Learn, hosted by SP3 Northwest. SP3 Northwest is Washington State University's business incubator. We provide wraparound support for early stage companies with scalable technologies. We are delighted to have as a sponsor for today's Lunch and Learn, Holly Troxel. Holly Troxel is a well-known all services, business services, a legal institution that employs wonderful people like our speaker today, Rick Rep. Um, Holly Troxel was formed in the state of Idaho and has recently expanded through acquisition of Witherspoon Kelly. And Rick joins us as one of those Witherspoon Kelly longtime representatives and an active member in the Spokane ecosystem who helps to inform fundraising. With that, Rick. All right. Thank you for that introduction. We are waiting for my slides to get loaded here in just a second. Um, it's good to see so many familiar faces. I, this is a great turnout. I appreciate you all being here on a beautiful sunny day here in Spokane. Uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to uh, meet some new faces as well and some new people in the room here. So I'm looking forward to having a chance to meet each of you afterwards. We uh, have my slides up on the screen and I can now push the button to keep them going. Uh -oh. yeah, let's see, push off to the side here. Uh, flip the screen and just select anywhere in this picture and then you'll be able to. All right, cool. All right, so uh, raising capital is one of the things that I have spent. Uh, uh, on behalf of clients uh, is something that I've been doing for over 22 years now. And uh, it's my my business practice has focused a blend between M&A transactions where companies are buying and selling other companies looking for an exit. And then also uh, companies that are raising money uh, from outside investors. And I'm going to, uh, for the purpose of this presentation, uh, it's important to understand the, the basic assumption that that I'm that we're dealing with startup companies, and that these are companies that, uh, by definition, are uh, scalable. That are generally in, expected to be able to uh, grow their markets and and develop um, a, a customer base for their products and services that allows them to scale uh, and 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 reach a, a certain level of magnitude. That eventually a company is going to want to either buy them or, back in the good old days, they would do an IPO. Um, we're, we're the, when we talk about startups, I, I, it's important to understand that we're, we're generally not talking about what are called lifestyle businesses. So uh, entrepreneurs that are looking to, to start a business that's going to keep them employed for the remainder of their career uh, as a way to make a living is generally not what we're talking about when we talk about startups. So that's an important uh, um, sort of premises here because uh, much of what I'm going to be talking about is uh, the type of um, of information you need to be aware of when you understand that that you're seeking money from outside institutional professional investors. And so that's one of the assumptions here. Uh, one of the other assumptions is that your startup is, uh, if you're if you're learning about fundraising in this context, we're, we're primarily talking about equity financing. We're not talking about uh, debt, uh, which you would get from a bank, for example. Um, there are, we will talk a little bit about convertible debt, uh, that converts into equity, but the purpose of this presentation is really to familiarize you with the concepts of equity financing. And again, that's something that I that I've done. I've done almost a, I've done over a billion dollars worth of private placements for the past twenty two years. Uh, it's it's easy to to rack up um, a number of transactions. I'm I'm currently working on two uh, M and A transactions with a third in the pipeline. I'm currently working on three Series Seed financings and three convertible note financings. So um, the numbers add up pretty fast when you're doing multiple deals at the same time. Um, and it's something I really enjoy doing. And um, so the, the first concept that I, that I want to make sure uh, everyone understands is that the type of financing that, you're gonna, you're, that you will do for your company is usually dependent on uh, what stage your company is at. And so at the, at the very beginning of a startup, it's expected that uh, it's the company is going to be founded 
funded by the founders. You know, the people that have the idea are going to put in some initial money to uh, see if they can even get uh, the idea developed. And then they might go out to their friends and family and say, hey, I've got an idea that I think is really going to change um, the marketplace with regard to this product or this service that I want to provide. And then they go out and they raise money from everyone they know and get as far as they can. And then once you've sort of exhausted all the friends and the family and your own resources, then it's time to go out and start looking for outside investors. And the initial investors that'll typically take a look at a, a relatively small startup that's still early stage business are called either angel investors or series seed investors. And, and the idea is that seed investment is money to you're, you're planting seeds in the ground to see what sprouts. Uh, angel investing means you're coming in from, you know, from the heavens and you're, and you're working a miracle in the lives of an entrepreneur. And so that's, that's kind of the background of this concept of seed investment or angel investment. And then once your company has developed and you've proven that you actually have a product, you've proven that you have customers for your product, then, and, and your, and your, your company has grown to the stage where you may be, you could actually put, you know, three to $5 million at work, then you might be uh, ready to start talking to a venture capitalist. But unless and until you're ready to raise three to $5 million, most venture capital firms aren't even going to be talking to you yet. So it's important to understand that's an important concept is, you know, everyone hears about the VC funding world, hears about, you know, Silicon Valley VCs. The reality is if your company is not able to put that much investment to work, you're really not ready for a VC. So you're, you're uh, for most startups, you're, you're going to be talking to seed investors or angel investors. Uh, there is a, also a, a fair amount of money out in the, out in the markets uh, from private equity firms and private equity funds are, are money that, that's been raised from institutional investors by professional investors who manage that fund but they're typically looking for advanced stage businesses that are already operational, already profitable. And typically, if you're, uh, when I see private equity coming in, many of the M&A deals that I'm doing are funded by private equity funds that are doing an industry roll-up. So they, they'll, they'll find a specific industry and they'll say, hey, um, we're going we're gonna to buckle together some some doctor's offices that all serve the same kind of purpose. Or we're going to buckle together some financial advisor offices in, in different regions around the country. And so that's and when you're talking about private equity funds, that's what you're usually seeing um, the, the type of investment is. And then, uh, but another important source of funding for uh, many companies is, is from other players within their specific industry. So if you're if your uh, company uh, has a certain industrial uh, focus and um, and it would it would make sense for a, another company that's in that same space to be able to expand their footprint, then uh, then you might see that type of acquisition uh, or investment. And and sometimes and the reason that is relevant to this conversation about equity financing is it's not unusual for an industry uh, player who is in the same uh, market and same. Uh, industry as your business to make a preliminary investment either by an equity uh, investment or by a convertible promissory note as a prelude to actually uh, acquiring your business. Now, a lot of times, most businesses will come in and say, I just want to take your business completely. But if there's, if you're still in the early stage of development, as many startups are, uh, what I'm seeing is that it's not unusual for a, a strategic strategic industry investor to just want to do a, a preliminary investment first and then uh, develop the relationship before they acquire the business, uh, usually because they want to, uh, they want some proof and evidence that the, that the product uh, and services are ready and that the market is there. Okay, so uh, this graph just sort of highlights the fact that um, the stage that you're at is going to is really going to de depend and, and the amount of money you're going to be able to raise and who you're going to be able to raise that money from is really sort of contingent upon how much revenue your business is making and how far along your business is, is in, in developing its products and services. So the idea here is that the, at the early stage of your business, you're, you're looking for money from angels or you might be even doing equity crowdfunding in some cases. Um, and then as your, as your revenue increases and as your, as, your, as your company becomes more established, then you can start looking uh, uh, at VCs and eventually maybe an exit with a private equity firm or a strategic investor. So in, when we talk about equity financing, 
And it's under it's important to understand what equity is and what that means. And it 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 the the simple answer is that it's ownership of your business, and ownership of your business as founders is typically uh, described as common stock. That is what uh, under state uh, corporate formation law, that's what is 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 the general basic equity issued to owners of the business. And it's very typical for founders when they when they dis establish a brand new business, they're going to establish how much common stock is owned by the respective owners. Uh, preferred stock is stock that is has special attributes that we're going to describe in more detail in, in, in additional slides, but it's it's usually what is issued to in institutional investors or outside investors, and it's because those outside investors want to have some additional protections. They want, they want to have some additional control uh, over what happens with the company once they put their money in, and they also want to have some assurance of getting their money back out. So those, and that's why preferred stock is what's usually. Um, is acquired by outside investors. And then uh, and then as a form of interim financing, we'll talk a little bit about convertible debt and promissory notes. But again, the, the idea is that here, it's a loan that uh, may or may not convert into equity in the company. So, and that's, uh, it's, it's usually viewed as an interim form of financing to get you to the next priced round. So a lot of times companies that that the, the the company and the investors can't agree on what an appropriate valuation for the business is, yeah. uh, in part because it's still so early that the perhaps the the products and services and or markets for those products and services have not been adequately developed, then a convertible promissory note may might may make sense. Another time that a convertible promissory makes uh, sense, and that's uh, you know the, the the three different notes that I'm working on right now, the note offerings uh, are for established businesses that have already. Um, proven that there's a market for their products and services, and they uh, they recognize that they need X amount of capital in order to expand and grow their business, and yet they're not quite ready to do a, a priced round because for one reason or another, um, either they're not going to be able to go out and raise as much money as they, they would currently like to in the current market and or uh, they want to achieve some other milestones that would that would change the valuation uh, profile of their business before they go out and do another price round. So uh, it's not unusual to see convertible promissory notes uh, used as a form of capital in between, say, a Series A and a Series B priced round with professional investors. Uh, I'm going to touch uh, just very quickly on safes as a simple agreement for future equity. This is basically just a contract where you agree with an investor that um, if they give you some money now, then you have a contractual obligation to make sure that they get whatever uh, form of equity you next issue to outside investors at a discount. And uh, they are generally viewed to be uh, founder friendly but they are also over time becoming less and less popular with professional investors in part because it's uh, a little bit too easy for a founder or for a company to issue multiple safe notes and then uh, end up having some wonky dilution issues going on uh, when you decide how, how they uh, are going to convert when you actually do a priced round. And so because they tend to discourage certain professional investors in doing a priced round, um, and some investors uh, discourage founders from doing safes in the first place. But depending on, um, I've, I've seen safes be successful as well, usually for smaller dollar amounts. And again, uh, before the company, the real advantage of a safe is it totally punts on the issue of, of valuation. Like if no one can agree what the company is worth today, and it's still so early stage that you have you don't have any revenue, um, and there's still some question of whether or not your, your product or service is going to get traction, then there are some programs um, Mind to Market here in, in, in the Spokane region, for example, provides safe uh, um, capital to uh, brand new startups that are still in the early stage of developing their concept. And in that context, it totally makes sense because there's still not even a proof of market yet, usually for many of these co um, companies. And so it's a, it's a great way for a founder to get some initial capital just to prove uh, their product, service, and market. Um, so there is a place for safes, but there is also, um, it's not usually the primary source of money for, for really growing your business if you've got an established product or service. Uh, I want to discuss what warrants are because sometimes I've seen entrepreneurs try to build warrants into their initial uh, offering 
And there, that, that may or may not be appropriate. One of the things that's not appropriate is you shouldn't be issuing warrants to your employees. I've seen uh, entrepreneurs try to do that before. Uh, and I've seen uh, founders trying to issue warrants early stage to other founders, and that's not really appropriate. Uh, the warrants are, are, if you think about them, they're basically a stock option for investors. And it's an ability to lock in the price at which they may choose to exercise buying more equity down the road. And so they serve a useful purpose, but they're usually used to sweeten the pot for an investor. If you're trying to convince them to come in and buy some of your preferred stock today, or even some common stock, I've used them, I've seen them used in common stock offerings. And, and if you're really trying to entice uh, a, a lead investor to make a, the, the, a, make the bulk investment that's going to encourage other investors to in, invest in your company, then sometimes the lead investor will receive warrants. And that way they know that they have an opportunity, if the company is successful, to, can, to um, acquire additional stock at a fixed price so that they, they, can, they can there's some built-in profit for them. Um, I'm also going to touch lightly on LLC membership interest and in units. Uh, if, you, if you have a limited liability company, then what you're issuing are membership interests or, and or units as a way to measure the ownership in that company. Uh, I've seen entrepreneurs kind of jumble the terms sometimes, that this idea that they're issuing shares in an LLC, that, that, that doesn't work semantics-wise, uh, what you would be issuing is membership interests. And uh, I, I, whether or not an LLC is appropriate is something that really depends on the profile of your business and who you anticipate raising money from in the future. So an LLC makes a lot of sense for a real estate development, makes a lot of sense for a restaurant, makes more sense for like a, a lifestyle type of business that's not going to be expanding and, and seeking money from um, uh, institutional investors down the road, specifically not VCs. If, you're, if, the, if the profile of your business is such that you're going to try to do a, a business to consumer product that's going to require a lot of marketing dollars and it's going to require you know, some significant scaling up that is going to require VC funding to actually be successful, then, then uh, I would discourage you from using an LLC in the first place because most VCs are going to require that you have a Delaware C Corp or they're not even going to invest. Um, and and one of the reasons that they that they're uh, strict about that is because uh, in their fund charter, they've told the investors in their VC fund that they will only invest in Delaware C corps. They won't invest in uh, LLCs. And part of that is because um, some of those uh, investors in that fund are not um, able to invest in uh, a pass-through uh, entity such as an LLC. And they don't want to receive any liabilities that may be passed through in an LLC before it's profitable. But one of the things that's nice for entrepreneurs is uh, that do that are using an LLC is that if they if their expenses exceed their revenue, then they can use the they can pass through those expenses and offset their taxes in their day job which is great for a restaurant owner, for example, but it's, that it, 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 it's a problem for VCs that don't want any pass-through liabilities coming through to their fund. So they'll basically, uh, anytime a, a professional investor is involved in a, a capital raise, I have typically seen them require that if you have an LLC, it converts into a C-Corp and usually a Delaware C-Corp. Now the question is why Delaware? Well, uh, part of that is because you know, the precedent for most startup fundraising happened in Silicon Valley, California. California's legal system is a mess. It's bureaucratic. It takes forever uh, to get uh, to achieve justice. And so uh, most uh, early startups in the Silicon Valley uh, world quickly uh, learned that uh, the gold standard of corporate law was in Delaware, where there's actually a dedicated court. Uh, to corporate uh, re resolving corporate disputes, and there's a lot of uh, precedent, and um, and the judges are educated about corporate law matters, and so for multiple reasons, Delaware became the gold standard for most Silicon Valley startup companies, like that that uh, like you know the the big names that we know of today, Facebook and, and Apple, et cetera, et cetera. And, and because they established that that precedent, and because the law in Delaware is so well established. Uh, and because VCs tend to copy each other and follow what are known as best practices, then um, they basically will insist upon a Delaware uh, incorporation. 
Now, if you're in Washington, there are some companies that buck that trend in part because Washington does have some, some decent case law as well as some decent corporate statutes that are that are somewhat predictable. So, I mean, there are some companies like Microsoft that are still Washington corporations and have, success, have proven that it's still possible to do. And I do have um, some other clients that have insisted upon staying uh, Washington corporations. And if they can make the compelling case to their investors and they don't need that out, outside uh, VC funding from you know East Coast VCs or VCs from outside the region, then maybe they can make the case. But um, if you're going to be raising money from, from VCs that are elsewhere outside of Washington State, then you're probably going to uh, find that you're better off just forming a Delaware C-Corp to begin with. So let's talk a little bit about uh, common stock and, and the attributes of common stock so that we can understand the contrast between common stock and preferred. So common stock, again, is what's typically issued to founders when they start their company and they divide up ownership of that company. Uh, by definition, uh, it, it, it sort of distinguishes uh, pro forma ownership or pro rata ownership. So if you're, um, you know, if you, if you have 100 shares outstanding and one person owns 20 and the other person owns 30, well, the person that owns 20 of the 100 shares owns 20% of the company and the person that owns 30 of those 100 shares owns 30% of the company. So that's, it's, it's a way of dividing up ownership. Uh, the attributes of common stock is that there's typically one vote per share. Uh, and the main thing that a common stockholder does in terms of exercising control over the business is, in, is electing the board of directors. And then the board of directors, you know, makes the decisions for the company. Um, they, they may or may not receive dividends from the company. If there's profits uh, distributed by the company, then, then the common stockholders would receive uh, a pro rata share of those dividends if they're declared by the board. Um, but uh, if you are a holder of common stock, then your rights and your uh, ability to, to get any money out of the company is usually subordinate to any of the, the creditors that the company may have, whether it be bank or otherwise, and also uh, sub subordinate to the rights to preferred stock, which, as we will see next, uh, typically includes uh, a, a preference on liquidation. So let's say the company uh, is sold. Uh, to another require or uh, is dissolved, then uh, either one of those uh, would, would meet the definition of a liquidation. And the idea behind preferred stock, the reason it's called preferred stock in part is because the preferred stockholders get a preferred return. They get their money back first before the common stockholders do. So you have to sell the company for less than, than all the capital that was invested. Uh, it's the preferred stockholders to get their money back first. Um, and they will typically also get a, a preference on dividends. So the, the preferred stockholders will will uh, will require that before any, any dividends, any any share of the profits can be distributed out to the common stockholders. The the preferred stockholders want to make sure that they get their dividends first. Um, and they uh, there's also uh, often uh, with advanced uh, forms of, of preferred stock, there's going to be there'll typically be some form of anti dilution protection so that. Uh, and that comes in a couple of different forms so that the common stockholders can't go out and just issue more stock and dilute the, the percentage of ownership that those preferred stockholders have. And, uh, and then one of the typical attributes of preferred stock is it typically converts into common stock uh, on certain triggering events. And those triggering events can include uh, a, a merger and acquisition where the company is acquired, a change of control. Uh, and or it could be if the company goes out and does an IPO and registers its stock on the stock market, then that typically triggers a conversion from preferred to common, uh, in part because if, the, if your stock is all of a sudden, if you've done an IPO and you're traded on NASDAQ, for example, then uh, in order for those preferred stockholders to have the liquidity that they want, the ability to sell their stock, it's the common stock is what typically gets registered with the SEC. And so the preferred shareholders are going to want their preferred stock to be common so that they're Prefer their common stock, their ownership is also registered for sale in the public markets. So that's that's why um, that's typically a, a, a conversion event. And uh, and then in terms of voting uh, for the directors, for example, uh, your your preferred stock will typically uh, vote on an as converted basis. So as as if you had converted into pre your preferred stock into common stock, that's how many votes you have. Uh, so let me uh, sort of break down this idea of what the preferred stock investors are looking for. They're looking for economic return, and they're looking for control and protection. So the typical terms that they will want to negotiate up in advance in their term sheet 
with regard to making sure that they get their money back because they're going to and and that they have the uh, the re potential return on investment that they're looking for is they're, they're going to negotiate the economic terms and economic terms includes what is the company worth at the time that they make the investment so valuation is one of the biggest negotiated um, terms of any deal at, at at the time of of investment some of these other terms are a little bit more standard and less subject to negotiation so liquidation preferences uh, are typically one X. They usually get their money back every now and then. In, in depending on the state of the market, uh, there 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 have been periods of time when investment capital was hard to come by, and and investors successfully negotiated two X liquidation preferences. But uh, the standard, is, it, the common the, the common liquidation preference, I, I still see most of the time as one X. Um, and one of the other terms that that helps protect their their economic interest in their investment is making sure that they have a right of first refusal if the company is going to be issuing any other new shares that they want to that's what, a way they protect themselves from a dilution is they be they're able to continue to buy some more of the stock or and or if the founders are selling their stock then they get to sell their stock with uh, and let's say so for a right of co-sale for example is an is a situation where the founder finds a buyer for the founder's stock and the, the, the buyer really wants to have a, uh, some ownership in this business. Well, if the preferred uh, shareholder has a co right of co-sale, then they get to sell some of their shares alongside the founder. And they, and they end up dividing up the total amount that the buyer agrees to, to purchase pro rata. And so it's a way to ensure that if the founder is getting to cash out a little bit, then the preferred sh shareholder gets to cash out a little bit as well. So that's that's the concept of co-sale. And again, that's just to make sure that the the, the preferred shareholder gets some money back. Um, one of the other economic terms that a preferred shareholder cares about is vesting. They're, they're going to care about uh, if the uh, employees are receiving equity compensation as an incentive, then they want to know how long those, those uh, employees are committed to working for the company before they get full ownership rights in that stock. So a lot of times you'll see a four-year vesting schedule required by the outside investors, uh, even for founders. If founders want to take some additional stock at the time that they're negotiating with outside investors, they will often, uh, the outside investors will often say, hey, founder, uh, any more stock that you get is going to have to be subject to a four-year vesting schedule so that I know that you're committed to sticking around. Um, and then... Uh, and then anti-dilution. There's there's different provisions that also uh, ensure that if 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 more stock is issued, then 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 they have an opportunity to either acquire more of that stock and ensure that their ownership position uh, does not get diluted excessively. And then there are control terms, and the control terms that are used to control what the business does and 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 how that business is run. Uh, one of the key elements of control is is making sure they, that the investor has a voice on the board. So most preferred investors will insist upon at least one board seat if they are the lead investor. Now, if if, if you have a, a multiple investors and you're one of the smaller minority investors in a preferred round, then you typically are not going to be able to successfully negotiate getting a board seat. But typically, uh, there will be a uh, an individual or two that does represent the preferred investors that will serve on the board and 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 is in, is expected to represent all of the preferred investors. Um, so that there's it's almost inevitable that if you have a preferred investment, there's going to be a, a, at least one preferred board seat. And then there's going to be uh, protective provisions that are required to be built into the uh, the rights and and that are associated with the preferred stock. And I've got a slide to, to break those down in a little bit more detail. Uh, one of the other things that that preferred investors can do uh, is is require a voting agreement that has drag along provisions. And so uh, the way that works, uh, if you if you have um, the founders and and certain other key investors uh, enter into this voting agreement, then they may agree that if the majority of of share of shareholders or the majority of the board agrees to do a change of control uh, transaction, for example, like the majority of, of owners of this company want to sell the company. But let's say some, some members of management, maybe one of the founders, might be more than one founder. Let's say one of the founders would prefer to keep the business uh, private and not and or in their own hands and not sell it to, to a, an acquirer. With a, if you have a voting agreement in place that has 
uh, a drag along provision. So long as a majority of the owners of the business want to sell it, then you can force the other uh, minority owners to go along and approve the sale of the business. That's that's the way. That's what a, that's one of the key things that a drag along provision does. Drag along provisions can also be used to require voting in favor of certain specified board members. Uh, to help ensure that the preferred investors retain their uh, representation on the board. Um, and, oh, shoot, this was the slide. I thought I fixed the typo on conversion, but I guess the, the slide didn't make it. Uh, but then, yeah, so there's, and then one of the things that will be negotiated is when does a conversion of the preferred stock um, get converted to, to common? And um, and that there'll be certain certain spelled out events that will either do an require will initiate a, 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 an automatic conversion or uh, allow the investors uh, the election to decide whether or not to make a con discretionary conversion. All right, so protective provisions. Uh, these are usually built into the certificate of incorporation if you have a Delaware C corp, articles of incorporation if you have a Washington C corp or, or one of the other states. And, and they're actually, when you authorize the preferred stock that you're gonna be issuing to these investors, the, the, the certificate that spells out the rights and privileges of the, of the preferred stock will list out some of these, uh, these provisions, uh, including this idea that um, you can't change the terms of preferred stock without approval of the preferred stockholders. Uh, you can't authorize new stock, which would uh, dilute the existing uh, shareholders without approval of uh, a majority of the preferred shareholders. You're not going to be able to issue uh, preferred stock that has rights that are senior to the existing preferred stock without approval of the preferred stockholders. Um, if, if the founders of the board wants to buy back some stock, uh, and, and which would increase the percentage of ownership for everyone that still holds their stock after that, and it's a way of getting, it's, a, it's an alternative way, you know, you can, you can distribute money to, to shareholders either through dividends or you could, do a, buy, you could buy their shares back. And that's a way to take the profits from the company and put it in the hands of the, of the shareholders. But again, the preferred stockholders are, are going to want to be able to approve or disapprove whether or not the company does that kind of buyback of its shares. Uh, if the company is 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 doing a is 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 a, is approached by uh, an acquirer and there's a potential change of control M and A transaction, the preferred shareholders will typically want to be able to vote on that and determine whether or not that change of control occurs. They're gonna uh, and and because many of these provisions that lay out these rights and privileges are are in the articles and bylaws and or again for a Delaware corporation in the certificate of incorporation. And then they, any change to those bylaws or charter documents also requires the vote and, and approval of the majority of the preferred stock. And uh, changing the board of directors is usually locked uh, into and requires approval of, of, the, of the preferred stock. Because again, the board is the, is the, is the body that actually makes the decisions for, the, for um, who the CEO is going to be and, and, the, and the macro um, the macro decision making for you know the direction that the company is taking, and so uh, who's on that board is very important to the investors, and so the preferred stockholders are going to want to make sure that no, you can't add someone to the board and dilute our effective control of the board or our voice on the board without our approval. And uh, declaring dividends, borrowing money, declaring bankruptcy. Again, these are all decisions that the preferred shareholders want to have a say in because they don't want the company doing it without their approval. And that's one of the ways they protect their investment. Um, I talk, I already touched a little bit on how drag along uh, voting, uh, drag along rights uh, within a voting agreement work. And, and there's this idea that you can force the parties that are uh, that that have signed on to the voting agreement to vote with the majority. Um, and and uh, we've talked a little bit about the fact that you know board positions are really important to VCs. So there is this idea that uh, a lot of the term sheets, the, the, there will be specific named individuals right in the term sheet. So I'm like, the, I'm looking at it. I just, I actually just pushed, pushed send on a series seed term sheet uh, this morning, and it specified who the two directors representing the series seed investors would be. Uh, usually, the investors have those those individuals identified up front. Uh, we talked a little bit about liquidation preference. So again, it's this idea that if an uh, investor puts in $100,000 and they have a 1x, 1x liquidation preference, then they're going to get $100,000 back upon the sale of the company. Uh, participation rights are this idea that if there's new stock issued, then the, um, 
then the investors also get to participate in purchasing some of that stock on the same terms so that they ensure that they get the same terms that the new investors get. Uh, there's other terms. I'm not going to try to go into all of them here, but um, you know, registration rights, information rights, that's an example of you know, the preferred investors may specify that um, if the company does an IPO, it does go public, then their stock is going to be registered alongside so that the company is not just selling new stock when it raises money from the public, but it's also going to be selling the investor stock. So that way, again, the idea is to protect their investment, make sure that they get, they get cashed out. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to keep rolling on here a little bit. Um, Again, I, I touched on the fact that a convertible debt or promissory note is, is, is a source of in, uh, interim financing. Uh, it typically does have an interest rate, but the investors are not investing in notes uh, because they're trying to, to, they care about the interest so much as they care about the ability to uh, help the company grow to the next milestone where it could actually do an equity financing round. And if the company is successful, then they're, what they really want is to convert into that next priced round of equity at a discount. And the typical discount that you see is usually right around 20% is kind of what the, the market rate has been. Sometimes you see 25%, even 30% discount. So, um, and that's this idea that they get, uh, you know, in addition to the shares that they currently have, they get 30% more of the dollar value in whatever the next round of investment is. And um, Typically, if there is a qualified financing, so one of the terms that gets negotiated is, okay, what, what's going to, what's going to, what's the definition of a qualified financing? How much money does the company have to go out and raise in its next round to force all the note holders into owning equity? And it's usually you pick a, you pick a milestone that uh, is, is attainable with the amount of money you've raised with a note. So let's say you've gone out and you've done a $2 million note offering. And with that $2 million, you expect to be able to, to um, expand the valuation of the company and advance the company so that your next round if, if, of a Series A might be a $10 million raise. So if you think that your $2 million, $2 million note offering is going to allow you to grow the company to the point where you can do a $10 million raise, $10 million raise with Series A, then you would set that as a qualified financing. And, and generally speaking, those note holders are going to be content and happy that you've grown the business valuation such that you can actually do a $10 million raise. That would, they would view that as, 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 as a success, and then they'd be happy to convert into that Series A uh, round of financing at a discount. Uh, one of the other things that's 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 also built into the negotiation of these these types of notes is the valuation cap, and that's usually this idea of what's what's a realistic um, dollar amount that the company is likely the valuation the company likely to be at if it's doing a, a ten million dollar raise. So if you're doing a ten million dollar Series A raise, your company may very well be worth a hundred million dollars, and so that might be set as the valuation cap. And this is I and the idea is that. You know, the, the, the preferred shareholder is going to have the opportunity to decide, do I want to convert at my 20% discount or do I want to convert uh, at whatever uh, discount I would get using the valuation cap? And if the company is valued at anything less than 100 million, then it's, it may make sense if that's your valuation cap to convert at the set 20% discount. But let's say the company hits it out of the park and now the company is actually worth 120 or 150, uh, then they may want to, their, their, their discounted conversion uh, may actually result in them receiving more shares if they convert at the valuation cap because the cap holds the, the dollar, the valuation at 100 million. So anything above 100 million then is additional uh, return to, the, to that investor. I talked about warrants, so I'm going to skip that slide. Um, the advantages of, of raising equity versus debt is uh, it, you don't have the you don't have the the loans on your balance sheet, uh, you don't have the monthly cash payments on the on the debt. Um, if you if your company just doesn't have uh, isn't credit worthy, doesn't have the profile that would be underwritten by a bank, then then you don't you can sidestep those issues. And, and usually the investors, uh, the, the, the type of investors that invest in equity come with a lot of experience. I mean, the, the professional investors do this on a regular basis, and therefore they come with their own network of contacts. And, and a lot of times these investors invest within a specific industry. And so therefore they have contacts within the industry that can create some synergy for a company. So they come with value. It's value added money is one way to think about it. So that's, the, that's one of the advantages of taking equity from a professional investor. 
Uh, the disadvantages of selling you know, a portion of your company is you're giving up a, a portion of control of your company. And especially with the preferred terms that come with a, that, that, are, that are required by a professional investor, you know, some of those, um, it, it, there are founders that eventually lose control of their business uh, through successive rounds of financing. And so they may or may not be replaced. They may or may not be deemed to be the appropriate CEO to continue the business on, on its trajectory. And, um, and uh, there's also other disadvantages. There's just, there's some, you know, just some administrative obligations and, and, and costs and burdens associated with providing information. Uh, usually the, the, one of the things that's negotiated is preferred investors are going to have some information, right? So they're going to require you to have some annual reports, quarterly reports, maybe even monthly reports. And, and you may or may not have the, the accounting staff and or um, structure to really produce those reports before you take their money. But uh, after you take their money, they're going to expect you to hire a CFO if you need one and make sure that you're able to report to them how the company's doing. And, um, and so, again, it, it, it can change the profile of your business. You know, once you start taking that outside money, it, the, the way your business is run is going to change because you're going to be reporting to outside owners. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind that anytime you're raising money through equity is you also have to comply with the securities laws. And I can actually do a complete separate presentation just on securities laws. In fact, I sometimes do for the Gonzaga Law School. And, uh, but I, I mean, the quick takeaway here is, and, and this is the one thing that I, that I always want entrepreneurs to be aware of is anytime you're taking money from outside investors, the securities laws apply and, and you don't want to mess with the securities laws because, uh, under both state and federal law, if you violate the securities laws, then the investors can come back, uh, for their original investment with interest and attorney's fees. And so uh, I encourage you to talk to a securities lawyer before you sell securities. Um, that's, that's, that's the main thing that I want to uh, convey about securities law. And then I also want to also, I want you to take away this concept that the definition of securities fraud is really broad. It doesn't mean that you intended to steal from people. That's not the definition of fraud in the securities world. In the securities world, the definition of securities fraud includes material misrepresentation, material misrepresentations or omissions. And so if you fail to tell uh, your investors some material piece of information that's relevant to an investment decision that you're aware of, then they can come back and say you committed securities fraud. So for example, you're going out and you're telling investors, hey, we have these great contracts in the pipeline but then you, but you fail to, you know, you, I mean, maybe that's, I mean, and maybe that's true at the time you put together your investment pitch deck. And so you're going out and saying, hey, we've got, you know, Target online to sell our products. And then fast forward to the day that they're actually putting their money in and you're taking their money and signing the contracts. And by the way, Target has said, no, we don't want the product anymore. So it, you have an obligation to update that information for those investors. Otherwise, they're investing upon false information. You omitted to tell them that the contracts changed. And so then they can accuse you of securities fraud. And that applies not just, it, it, it's, it's a liability, not just for the company, but it also it's officers and directors. So please be careful with the securities laws. Um, and the definition of security is basically, again, any money from outside investors. Uh, there's lots of people that try to pay, play cute. It's like, no, I didn't. I, that's not a, uh, you know, a loan is not a, uh, a security. Well, in most cases, a loan is a security. If it's not, if it's not uh, uh, secured by your house, then you're and you're issuing it uh, from your startup, then it's probably a security. Um, so, like, before you go to all these, like, when you're doing your official fundraising, like family and friends, like all the people gave you money before you really got yes. started. Yes, the securities laws protect your Aunt Millie as well. So just a couple more slides and I'll take some questions here. Um, I was asked to talk about the concept of value, uh, pre-money versus post-money capitalization. And uh, the, the, the math can, can get complicated pretty quickly and you'll have access to this slide after my presentation. So I'm not, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time here. But the thing that I want to point out is the reason that investors spend a lot of time focusing on the valuation of the company and, and they talk about you know, pre-money valuation, the reason that's really important is because you start off, if, if they tell you that your business is worth $2 million and that's what they're willing to value the, your company at before they invest, so let's say, uh, and, and, 
and at that point in time, so the, the, the example I have here, the founders already have a million shares outstanding. That's just what the founders issued to themselves when they formed the company. And then the investor comes along and says, okay, well, so we're, we're going to value your business at 2 million. So that's going to drive the, 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 the share price of what your company is currently worth at that moment in time. Because if, if you agree that your company is worth 2 million, you have a million shares outstanding, then pre-money, before the outside investor money comes in, that means that each one of those shares that you have are worth $2 a piece. And this is back when the founders own 100% of the company. Okay, so then let's say that the, the outside investors put in $500,000. And then your post-money valuation is going to be to, uh, it's gonna, where did I go here? It's easier to see on this one. <laughs> yeah, so the total valuation then post money is 2.5, right? And then, but if you if you look at the, the the amount of money they put in right here, they they take the amount of money that they put in, the 500,000, and they divide it by the price that was established free money to determine how many shares they get. That drives how many shares they get. So that's why the valuation and the, it drives the price, which drives how many shares they get. And so what I want to highlight with this slide is the fact that in this scenario, where you, where you agree that the pre-money valuation is $2 million, then in this, in this example, the founders would end up still owning 80% of the company, and the investors are going to get 20% of the company based upon their investment of $500,000. So this next slide shows the contrast of what happens if, you, if they negotiate that the value of the business is only a million. So if, they, if you agree on a pre-money valuation of a million dollars, then you take the numbers and, the, and you still have a million shares outstanding, then all of a sudden the price per share is now only a dollar per share. That's pre-money before the investors come in. And so the end result is they put in the same amount of money with a different valuation. So then now the post-money valuation is only 1.5 million, not 2.5 million. And then look what that does to the ownership. Rather than the outside investors owning 20% of the company, now they own a, a third of the company. So that's, it's, it, it's, it's easy for entrepreneurs, and I've seen it happen, get caught up on the price per share that they, that they, want, out, they want to go out and do an offering. And, and so often the outside investors aren't going to talk about the price per share. They don't care about negotiating the price per share as much as they care about negotiating the valuation as the company as a whole on a pre-money basis because they know that'll drive the cost per share or the price per share and how many shares they get. So that's that's the key thing I wanted to highlight with those two slides. We have about five minutes left. So if there's any online questions, why don't we go ahead and have them in? Okay, good. So I, I made it through my slides. So we have five minutes for questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I do, I do. What I have here are some resources. I mean, most of this, most of the stuff I'm telling you is 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 out there in the internet world. Uh, many of the documents that are used by uh, professional seed investors are available. Uh, the Series C documents are. You start off with form documents. Even VCs uh, for a Series A will start off with established VC documents. Um, it's it's the, the the value of a lawyer is not preparing that first draft of the documents per se. It's understanding what the variable terms are and what the impact to you and to the investor is on negotiating the variable terms. But most of the standard terms are pretty well set. So with that, I'll take questions. All right, we don't put it in the chat, but- Okay. I'm always asking what's the value of the company, the valuation. But um, in mind to market, since you're familiar with that, um, when they invest money, um, and let's say the company doesn't go, uh, are you responsible to pay back that money? Uh, because you said that it's a debt, but it's sort of not a debt in my market. Yeah, it's not a true loan. That's that's what's different about a safe. It's not a, it's not a, a promissory note that and and that are typically you don't normally see them. Uh, having a security agreement where the collateral of the, of the company secures that uh, safe agreement, like, uh, like you would typically would see with a loan or a debt instrument. So most debt instruments, there's some form of collateral as security for paying back. And a lot of times, you know, if, if you go into a bank, the bank is going to require the founder, the entrepreneur to personally back up that loan, that debt. A safe, there is a riskier instrument for the investor 
because they typically don't have security or collateral. So if the company goes out of business, then the investor is just out of luck. And that's one of the reasons investors aren't as fond of safe agreements. Can you speak a little bit more about valuation and what that, uh, what that's a function of? Like, for example, as a founder, I assume your interest is to keep as much percentage of your company. An investor is probably going to look at that, right? They want to take more percentage of your company. So what does that what does that look like once the process? Do you wait until you absolutely need the capital so you can increase your valuation and then retain most of the percentage? Or? So there's a trade-off, right? There's a trade-off with regard to how much can you grow the business without outside capital? And is can can you establish your products and your services in a in, and and compete against the competitors successfully without that outside capital? Or and are you content with the size of the business and the profits that you're receiving versus with that outside capital, you can quickly expedite your growth and, you know, and, and take the business to where it needs to be to compete against the competitors and establish the market share. So if, and, and the way that I, that I typically discuss it with my clients is, okay, do you want to own 20% of a hundred million dollar company, or do you want to own a hundred percent of a $10 million company? You know, and so it's it the and maybe those aren't maybe that's not the best math, but but the end result is that's how you have to think about it. You can have a hundred percent of a small pie, or you can have a smaller percentage of a much bigger pie. And the idea is that outside capital allows you to grow the pie faster than you ever would on your own, bootstrapping it with your own revenue. Hey, Rick, this is Tyler Alvarado. Another question here. Yeah. crowdfunding or equity position, how does that impact this? If you're a startup and you put it on Start Engine or something like that, and you get Joe Blow and 10,000 other people who buy a share at a time, what does that do to this? Well, it messes up your cap table and it makes it harder for, for you to attract uh, the true professional institutional investors because they typically don't like to see a cap table that has a whole bunch of small investors that put in small amounts of money and then all still have ownership rights and and then and create potential securities law liability and uh, and fiduciary obligations to the directors, et cetera, et cetera. So there, I, I typically tell my, I have some clients that have successfully raised money using equity crowdfunding. And, you know, hallelujah for them, that it was, it, it was, it was really the only source of funding that they were able to find. And so, and so it worked for them and, and, but they still now have this profile that they won't, there are certain institutional investors that won't touch them. And so that's the trade-off, right? They, they, they were, and so the end result is I usually tell my clients that are looking for various uh, funding sources Equity crowdfunding should be your 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 the resource of last resort. If you can possibly conv convince you know angel investors, seed investors, to and friends and family to invest in your company on sort of more standard terms, then that's your better that's a better bet because there there are just there it's just there's just the more investors you have, the more potential liability you have, and the more handholding you have. It's it is it's it's it, it is a labor intensive process to answer emails and phone calls from people that own their own your business and want to be treated like an owner. Yeah. So the more of those you have, the more cumbersome it, cumbersome it is. And then in the chat, can you speak to the double-edged sword of uh, valuation as it relates to exit strategy? So it's it's interesting. You would you would normally think that going out and raising money at the highest possible valuation you can would be the best possible thing you can do. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to dilution of the of of the founders, that's true. The founders want to raise money at as at, at a as, as at a reasonably high valuation because then they're giving up less of the company to raise that money. There is a double-edged sword associated with the fact that if you raise money at uh, the top of the market and then there's some fluctuation in the market and then all of a sudden uh, you have a hard time um, achieving a buyer for your company at this this elevated uh, valuation that you successfully achieved earlier then it could make it difficult for you to actually get an exit so that's the double-edged sword the double-edged sword is you want to go for you know a reasonably high valuation 
but you don't want to be so high that then it, 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 it ties your hands for what comes next. Because you might scare off buyers you might and you might or you might be priced out of the ipo market mm -hmm. and so we've seen we've seen the market change within the past couple of years right the pre-covid the, the market was running really hot and so valuations were high and so companies could go out and raise money with this really high valuation and then now we're in a current environment where valuations are being squeezed by professional investors they're not willing to accept some of the high valuations that they would have accepted before and so now the companies face the the, the possibility of doing a down round Having to raise, if they need to raise more money, then they are going to have to raise it at a lower valuation, at a lower price per share, and that can be brutal for the existing shareholders that then get diluted even more than they would have otherwise. Okay, oh, one more. Can we can we do one more? Um, we might be offline now, but or are we? <laughs> I'll let you guys talk afterwards, so um, I get to end next to you again. Um, Using my microphone. Yeah. Exactly. Right. <laughs> So thank you so much, Rick, for that very informative discussion. And thank you to Holly Troxell for sponsoring. We hope to join you all, both virtual and in person, next month when we're going to be talking about types of incorporation, which Rick um, touched on during his presentation. Uh, with that, we're going to say adios to our virtual folks, our in people folks. Uh, feel free to talk with one another, ask some questions. And we will wrap up in a little bit. Well, and thank you for your attention and your questions. I appreciate it.